Hi, everybody. We'll get started here in just a minute as folks come in. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, I am Erin Haight Forsyth. I'm the Associate Director of the Rock Ethics Institute and Associate Professor of Women's, Gender and Sexuality Studies as well as Political Science here at Penn State. And I'd like to welcome everybody um, to this great event on ethics and political communication. I'd first like to thank, of course, the Rock Ethics Institute for putting this together, as well as our co-sponsor, the uh, McCourtney Institute for Democracy here at Penn State. Um, so I'm gonna introduce our panelists for today. They will each briefly speak um, on how they understand ethics in um, the sort of realm of political communication coming from each of their individual backgrounds. Um, and then we're just gonna get into a pretty freewheeling discussion um, about sort of the nature of ethics in this very politically interesting and sort of volatile time. So I'll start with our guest, Peter Loach, who is the Associate Professor at, of, in the School of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University. He's also the director of the Project on Ethics in Political Communication, as well as the editor of Political Communication Ethics Theory and Practice, which was published by Roman and Littlefield in 2020. Uh, Dr. Loach has more than 25 years of experience in politics, including serving in senior staff positions in the US House, Senate, as well as the Obama administration. He's been a lobbyist and a communications consultant and has led, helped lead, and advised numerous public and private sector organizations. Next, we have Dr. Mary Stuckey, who's the Edwin Earl Sparks Professor of Communication Arts and Sciences here at Penn State. She's also the editor of uh, the Rhetoric and Public Affairs Journal. Um, she specializes in political and presidential rhetoric, political communication, and American Indian politics. She's the author, editor, or co-editor of 12 books and author or co-author of roughly 80 essays or book chapters. And her current book project is on the rhetoric of political change. Um, last but certainly not least, we have Patrick Plaisance, who's the Don W. Davis Professor in Ethics and the editor of the Journal of Media Ethics in the uh, College of Communications here at Penn State. Dr. Plaisance is also um, an affiliate faculty member here at the Rock Ethics Institute. His research focuses on media ethics theory, moral psychology theory and methods, and the philosophy of technology as applied to media systems and practices. He's published more than two dozen journal articles and book chapters, and his work has appeared in research journals, including communication research, communication theory, the Journal of Communication and Journalism and Mass Communication Quarterly. And he also has a career of nearly 15 years as a journalist in New Jersey, South Florida, and Virginia, where he specialized in state level political reporting. So I'd like to welcome all to this panel. Thank you so much for being with us. And if we could start with you, um, Peter, uh, how do you understand ethics in political communication, given your background, both in academia as well as in practice? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And I should know I'm not, I'm not a doctor. I quit the PhD program to, to work for a congressman. Um, weirdly enough, at the time, the job security working for a Democratic member of the House of Representatives seemed, seemed better than trying to be an international relations theorist who is interested in critical theory and postmodernism. Tells you a lot about both fields. So I, I launched the project on ethics and political communication uh, two years ago to, to promote the study, teaching, and practice of political communication ethics. Feels like it should be a thing. And, and the question on the table for the project is what ethical responsibility, if any, do political communication uh, professionals have and to whom or what do they have them? And I ask the question because I don't know. Uh, I have some ideas, but 
you know, as you, you said in your overly generous um, introduction, um, I've, I've been doing this for a long time, but I'm not entirely sure. I would have a couple of observations though that I, I tend to share with people. Um, the first is um, the politics and political communication in America have never been, they've never been good. You know, um, Jefferson and Adams famously went at it um, in the Jefferson Adams presidential campaign, the president of Yale, which is sort of the, the Penn State of Connecticut is one way to think about it, said that if, if Jefferson were elected president, our wives and daughters would be subject to legal prostitution. Uh, at the end of uh, President Washington's second term, uh, Congress hated him so much that they proactively voted to not take a break to wish him happy birthday. So they not merely ignored the president, they actually went out of their way to tell the president they were, they were ignoring him. This just isn't, you know, high-minded political discourse isn't something we're great at in this country. Um, so it's always been bad. Uh, the second thing I would suggest is that uh, most big political communication ethics decisions aren't, they're, they're not the big ones, right? Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, got it. If we're that simple, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Uh, most of the questions are tougher. Uh, we end up sort of, you fudge a little bit here, you fudge a little bit there, right? I have spent a lot of time working in politics and, and no one's ever offered me the bag of cash. Uh, I spent part of 2016 flying around the country with a commissioner of the US Food and Drug Administration, meeting with university presidents and industry leaders and such. And, and nobody ever came up to me and said, look, thanks so much for coming out and spending time with us. It's great to see you. I have a medical device that's stuck in your approval process. Can you give it a second look? I'm not asking for anything untoward, that would be wrong, but is that your Gucci bag of cash you left in the corner? If it had, I'm not sure I'd be with you, with you here now. That, but that, that just isn't how it goes. What typically happens is you think, well, this isn't quite right, but the stakes are so high, we have to do it. Or, you know, this isn't quite right, but we'll fix it on Monday. Or, you know, maybe not this time, but it's the, and you end up sort of drowning by degrees. So I think that, uh, the, and the, the last observation I would make is that a lot of political communication isn't about running for office. That's what gets the headlines, because that's when most people pay most of the most, of, uh, the most attention. But a lot of it is, you know, donating to the World Wildlife Fund or participating in your local homeowners association or sort of the day-to-day -day public squareness, which makes up the, which which makes up a democracy. So I'd suggest that I I'm part of this. I'm excited for this conversation so I can hear what others think the ethical responsibilities are um, and the questions we explore with the project, with with a five question series, with with videos, with with a book, with some writing, and and I really I look forward to hearing from fellow panelists and, and hopefully folks tuning in for, for their take. Um, sorry about that. I had a video glitch. Um, I also have a puppy in my lap, so weird things may or may not happen. Um, I think Peter's comments are super helpful um, because most of the research on political communication in general tends to be focused on campaigns because they're predictable, they're limited, they're repetitive. So there's great comparable data across time and across uh, geographic um, sorts of um, places. But I mean, you can do states, you can do national to state, right? So campaigns lend themselves in um, very obvious ways, I think, to being studied. but and there are super important ethical questions when it comes to campaigns. But I think um, as a scholar of the presidency, I wanna focus on two kinds of ethical responsibilities presidents have. Um, the first one is what I would call administrative. Uh, they do take an oath as does everybody who works for the federal government to see that the laws are faithfully executed, right? Those laws stem, at least in theory, from the constitution you know, federal statutes and whatever. Um, but presidents, because they administer the bureaucracy, often hold themselves to a standard that goes to the spirit of the laws, um, which has led presidents to do some wonderful things and also not so much, right? And um, often they do really terrible things immediately after elections. Um, Roosevelt gets reelected um, by a, a huge majority in 1936 and immediately tries to pack the court 
and two years later tries to purge Congress. This is not um, a terribly unusual sort of thing that presidents do because they believe that they embody in some way the spirit of the ethics of the Constitution and that they should have a little more leeway. As Richard Nixon famously put it, if the president does it, it's not illegal. Um, he turned out to be wrong about that. Um, so that takes us to the second kind of important ethical responsibility presidents have, and that's what I would call a representational ethics. Um, their job in many ways is to speak for all the people. Um, they are um, generally, with at least one very notable exception, um, they strive to, to evoke the better angels of our nature uh, to command some level of unity and some level of breadth. Um, so maybe don't ignore um, you know, minority people, although of course for centuries in our country that's been happening. Um, they rely on the myth of immigration to authorize many of, you know, we are a great melting pot. And those kinds of constitutive arguments serve very particular purposes. They come with some pretty important ethical challenges. Um, if you happen to be an Indian, for instance, you know, grounding the country in the frontier myth may not be, you know, uh, uh, to you an extremely ethical uh, or um, positive thing. So that's where I sit with questions of administrative and representational ethics. Great. Um, thank you, Peter and Mary. Um, really interesting ways to, to get the conversation started here. Um, and I, I guess as the media person here, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, uh, veer off a little bit to to offer a consideration of not politicians, um, not the political system, but of course the media, um, uh, how the media performs in covering the political system, how the media, what the ethical implications are for how we do political journalism in this country. Um, uh, and as someone who was a political reporter for many years, um, you might say that I, I might have been part of the problem for, for, uh, for a long time. But, I, but I'd like to talk about um, some, of the, some of the perils and some of the promises of political journalism in, in this country now. Um, but also, I'd like to offer consideration of a, a totally different population, which is um, media audiences and, and Americans who consume um, uh, media content and, and, and political content um, more specifically. And I want to offer um, uh, the, the, the argument that um, when we talk about um, ethics and communication, ethics and politics, um, we can't forget to, to, uh, to include the ethical obligations that, that all Americans have, that we all have um, as citizens and as media consumers. Um, and uh, more and more in, in my area, um, it, it, in terms of teaching for sure, um, I've, I've been talking um, uh, a lot about um, media literacy um, or the problem of media illiteracy in this country and how it is directly connected to some of the um, uh, political ethics concerns that uh, that have been that have been, been mentioned um, so uh, so turning back to political journalism and, and how we do journalism now in this country and what effect does it have um, good and bad um, when I think of, of the ethical obligations of political journalists, who I used to be, um, uh, I, I would hope that one, one moral obligation is to make sure that, that political journalism shouldn't be a slugfest, or not only a slugfest, um, and, it, and it, should, it should spend a lot of time trying to open all of our eyes to the realities of people who are different from us. Um, and uh, in, in some ways, I think uh, the political journalism that we see today makes a really good effort to do that. In other ways, not so much. 
Um, I, I also, um, I think there's a lot of problems uh, that we have uh, in my area um, have talked about for a long time, done a lot of research on, on the routinization of political journalism in, in the news media environment. Every topic um, tends to be a political story or tends to be made into a political story. And that means um, a, a emphasis on conflict. Um, and uh, in many cases that makes perfect sense. In other cases, it's, it's, kind, of a, it's kind of putting salt in the wound. Um, uh, and I would, I would suggest that oddly enough, we, we have too much political news and too little. And I'd like to talk about that later. We have, we have too much of a certain type and too little of another type. Um, and I also um, uh, think it's important to note that, um, you know, when we talk about political communication, the newsroom culture of, of journalism runs deep. Um, uh, and so there are all kinds of systems of incentives and sanctions um, that, that um, result in what political journalists do. Um, uh, you can't write good political journalism with authority um, if you don't know the, the inside game, right? The, the, the game of inside baseball um, on the state level, on the, on the, on the local level, on the national level. So we want, I would hope, we want our political journalists um, to spend a lot, in, a lot of time and energy knowing that, that um, game of inside baseball. The problem is, though, we, we confuse that inside game with something that the average audiences in America actually is interested in, right? Um, and so that's a problem, the problem of, of our fixation on polling um, in, in uh, political coverage is, is chronic. Um, the problem of horse race coverage, um, episodic framing, if you will, um, is chronic. Um, I think it's also a, a continuing problem that too many of our political journalists are um, upper middle class and white. <laughs> um, uh, and thankfully, we, we, are, we are much, much better at gender parity um, now in, in the media environment. Um, but still, that's, that's an issue. Um, and, and turning to um, media audiences and the questions of media literacy, um, more and more, I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned about um, how we're struggling with um, a low level of media literacy um, among Americans, um, uh, uh, patterns of news avoidance, um, patterns of poor news diets, patterns of category, category errors made by American audiences about what they think is political journalism, what they think is news and versus punditry. Um, of course, the 800 pound gorilla in, in media ethics is what, is, what um, is in your head when you hear the term media, right? And for many, many Americans, what pops up in their head when they hear the term media is cable TV, right? Cable TV programming. Um, and I would suggest that's part of the problem, right? Um, uh, I'm, I think that there's amazing, great political journalism, thoughtful journalism being done every single day. Um, and, and I see that, um, but in the minds of regular Americans, when they hear the media or when, even they, when they hear political news, they don't see that, they hear, they see, they see cable TV, they see Bill Mayer, they see Steve Ducey and Ainsley Earhart, right? So, um, so we need to, I think, really um, continue the battle with media literacy um, and, and uh, help people make some critical distinctions that I would argue cable television formatting invites people to blur, and that's been part of the problem. So, uh, so lots, lots to talk about. Thanks everyone, but uh, there is a lot to talk about. So if you know, folks don't mind, I'm just gonna jump right in. Um, so linking what you've said, Peter, Mary, what you've said, and Patrick, kind of going around ideas of media literacy, um, the perils and promises of the media, as well as the ethical responsibilities of the president, of course. And then Peter, to your point about almost a slippery slope of ethics around political communication, I'd like to talk a little bit about misinformation. Um, misinformation is a huge topic right now, especially after the 2020 election, 
conspiracy theories gained much all of this new attention from QAnon to Trump's demand that election officials find more votes. So just to the panel, um, how has misinformation changed politics? And how could a discussion of ethics in political communication challenge some of the negative impacts of misinformation in our politics? So I think it's important to um, underline as Peter did earlier, that misinformation isn't new. Um, and partisan divisions on information are also not new. What is probably new and the media people here can uh, correct me when I get this wrong, um, is that in general, people shared the same set of facts and interpreted them differently. Uh, and now we have people who seem to be uh, invested in different sets of facts, uh, some of which are not empirically accurate. <laughs> uh, and um, the other thing that I think changes the dynamic is the rapidity with which the misinformation is circulated, right? So the one thing that we haven't talked about yet is the ethics of circulating. Um, I, I teach a propaganda and persuasion class and one of the assignments is to listen to a podcast. And one of the episodes on the podcast is called The Spy Who Didn't Know She Was a Spy um, because she was um, retweeting information from the EPA that was designed to make it appear as if it came from her. And so that's an example, of course, of government propaganda, but the way in which people are like, oh, that was funny, or oh, that seems right, and they just circulate it. And it, the, the cycle of circulation, I think, is what has made things even more pernicious than the history of, the long history of misinformation. Yeah, if, if, if I may, Mary, um, I, I think you're right. Um, uh, the, the patterns of circulation dissemination is, is certainly a problem. Um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in one word, um, well, in two words, social media. Uh, that, the, the, the driver of, of the train of misinformation um, is social media. Um, uh, we have all kinds of, of interesting studies um, on how social media um, uh, uh, leads people astray in all kinds of ways. Um, there, there, there are, you know, the, the filter bubble phenomenon. Um, uh, we had a, a study from Pew um, just last year. The more people rely on social media for the political news, the less engaged and the less knowledgeable they actually are, right? So, so we, have, um, we have this, this systematic balkanization. Um, and not only that, um, uh, underlying that, that, that the architecture of the platform, I think, is this, is this culture of privileging opinion. Um, uh, you know, uh, we have so, we, we live in a, in a culture of, of communication by meme. Um, and and um, the, arc, the very architecture of social media um, lends itself to pontification, to proclamation. You know, here is what I like. Here is here is what I think. Um, it's a privileging of opinion um, over above um, actual engagement, um, actual information exchange. Um, and uh, uh, just recently, we have uh, I saw uh, some research on um, journalists and their use of the social of the Facebook uh, news media feed. So um, the whole news industry is really at the mercy right now of Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and some other um, big tech giants. And so me personally, I'm very happy, I'm very hopeful that we're seeing a real shift in the level of scrutiny and expectations of, of uh, social responsibility when it comes to big tech. That's another conversation. But um, you know, uh, algorithms by the, of the, uh, uh, that are used um, uh, in Facebook for their newsfeed have literally forced editors and news organizations to make changes in the types of news that, that are produced and promoted. Um, stories that boost engagement rather than stories that emphasize facticity and information. Um, and these algorithms place a premium on immediacy, on interactivity, on participation. Editors and, and journalists have responded because that's, that's, um, that's gonna be de uh, the defining um, feature of, of their ability to reach audiences, unfortunately. 
Um, so here you have a case where news feeds from social media are really training or retraining in an unfortunate way, I think, um, journalists uh, to, to serve that and to, and to feed this, this culture of privileging opinion. You know, if, if I might, this is this is fascinating. You couldn't see because our videos were turned off when you were making your, your remarks. I was nodding along when both of you were speaking, um, as I was just now. And a couple of things strike me that I'm glad you both brought up. The first is, once again, the history of all of this. It's not like American political discourse and the journalism industry was, you know, puppies and rainbows. And then Donald Trump and Twitter came along and the wheels came off. It, it is worth noting that in Federalist One, written by Alexander Hamilton, before he was a song and dance man, he had something as a career as a, as a politician, wrote that ambition, avarice, personal animosity, party opposition, and many other motives not more laudable than these are as apt to operate as well upon those who support as those who oppose the right side of a question. Right, so our friends are just as bad as our enemies. And again, this is Federalist One, right? It's worth noting that Mank won an Academy Award, which I understand several people watched last, the, the other night. And it was, it was about the making of a movie about a guy who made a living kind of making stuff up. Right, you provide the pictures. I'll provide the war. Right, we've 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 been down this um, um, in in ideological origins of the American Revolution by Bernard Bailyn. He quotes George Orwell, who was a collector of, of early pre-revolutionary pamphlets of all things, as pointing out that the pamphleteers uh, succeeded if what they wrote was. I mean, it could be it could be in verse, it could be in song, it could be serious, it could be fact-based, it could be satire, but it had to be polemical and short. But I think, as you've both noted, one of the things that's changed is speed and reach, right? It's faster and it goes further and we're more easily uh, duped, right? We're all accidental spies, right? That's a terrific story. And then you sort of look at, I'm sort of thinking about what did I, what have I been tweeting out? And, and am I as guilty of that? Um, I would also suggest that uh, two other quick thoughts. One is, uh, if something is clearly wrong, stop doing it. That's not the hard part. The hard part is how do we assess risk? How do I express risk? How am I framing an issue, right? Does a vaccine doom 15% of the people? Does it fail to protect more than one in 10 Americans? Or can it quite possibly save 85% of lives? That's Conrad Tversky's decision-making under risk, right? They're both true, but it's a framing question, right? Is the death penalty uh, so great work on, on, on death penalty and policy framing was done by Frank Baumgartner when he was at Penn State before he went down to, to Chapel Hill. And, and he, are, he, he notes that the death penalty debate when it was about uh, Jeffrey Dahmer and people who rape and murder children and store them in freezers, we had executions. When the death penalty became about innocent people on death row, DNA testing about lawyers, we stopped executing people, right? So both are true. You know, when does what what there are all sorts of ethical implications there. So it's not just the simple stop lying. The last observation I would make actually, again, isn't mine. I'm just going to footnote everybody I, I cite. Um, comes from a, a I was speaking at a uh, conference of, of communicators, PR people for the political left, basically. And one of them said our challenge is to make the truth clickbait. And I do want to put that out to to both of you. Um, like why is it just the bad guys is it the good guys are, are boring is garbage more compelling like why don't we just do better sorry aaron i didn't mean to steal your role here but I, i'm sort of wondering about that so i think that's a great question right and it's kind of the question rhetoricians have been asking for i don't know millennia like, how do you make ethical communication compelling? And, um, you know, we all know that um, dirt sells, right? The purient sells, the, the ugly sells. The book I just finished is called Deplorable, The Worst Elections from Jefferson to Trump. And um, it's kind of astonishing how often this rhetoric circulates, um, particularly in presidential campaigns, as we've noted. Um, but one of the things that's very interesting is that when there's pushback, and there's good political science literature on this, that when you say that's racist, Americans go, oh, we don't really want to be racist, 
right? It's when you let it sneak in like the Southern strategy, you know, under the radar, um, over the transom, you know, in whatever way it sneaks in when you're not looking, that's when people start believing it. But if you say to people, that's racist discourse, it has these kinds of negative consequences. The calling out of that kind of rhetoric is super important. And so historically, what's interesting about presidents is that when they get elected using this kind of terrible anti-democratic exclusionary discourse that has been often present, you know, sort of depressingly often, um, when they get to office, they very often decide at that moment that they're going to be president of all the people. They learn new tactics. They adapt to audiences they didn't speak to before. So they become, as president, they often still do terrible things, but they become sort of less deplorable than they were on the front end. And the discourse will fade away for a while. What's interesting about Trump is that he didn't do that. He came to office and he never sought to expand his base. He didn't talk to more people. He wasn't, a, um, he talked to the same narrow base he talked to all along. And he never learned new tactics. And so one of the reasons that he lost in 2020 is because he was running the 2016 election again. And it wasn't like Hillary Clinton wasn't his opponent. It wasn't 2016. There was this virus. Um, and so there is this way in which if you push back, if you learn, if you adapt, you can push that kind of unethical discourse. You can't ever get rid of it, but I think you can push it out to the margins. Um, but if you don't push back against it, then it's going to sort of take over the center. Well, I mean, as you know, pushing back does work. And, and recent research by Ethan Porter, Wood, and others have noted that fact-checking actually works and the backlash effect probably isn't there, which is, which is comforting. And I, and I know, Professor Plaisance, you write for Psychology Today. And so I'm glad that's sort of making its way into the discourse. But as you know, Professor Stuckey, this is, these are issues with, with which rhetorical scholars have been, been wrestling for millennia, right? I mean, Plato made a pretty good living beating up on people who thought they could teach the art of politics which is Socrates' phrasing of Protagoras' claim of what he does, right? And part of the argument against me, like you think you're part of the problem is the news media. I lobbied for America's Funniest Home Videos, right? Like when the revolution comes, they're stepping on you to get to me, right? But there's this, this strain also though in, in rhetorical theory from them, Cicero and Quintilian and on forward, that there is an ethical obligation in this which falls out of rhetorical theory Right, and, and it falls off of sort of academia and the popular press. And I would suggest a more recent version of it, to whom we can turn, would be Richard Weaver. Right, his politics aren't my politics. I worked for, you know, the last Democrat in the White House. But he argues that if we speak to transcendent values, but to who we are in the moment, that kind of works. Right, so is that the answer? That we just have to reground ourselves in classical rhetorical theory and get away from the kind of clickbait assumption of these things? It doesn't even work for journalism. I mean, I'm only speaking for half of this. Now, by the way, I will die on the hill of defending Protagoras. Yeah, I'm sort of surprised to hear you dying on the hill of defending Richard Weaver, but we can have that going. No, no, I just, I like his approach. I like his approach, I think. So uh, I, think I want to hear from Patrick on this, of course, but um, I want to say that transcendent values have also become trickier. Right. I mean, I studied FDR for a long time and FDR gives a nation, a nationwide prayer on D-Day, you know, in which he lays out the aims of the war. He, it's a prayer to a Judeo-Christian God. Um, and it's, you know, only Roosevelt, but which it becomes Judeo-Christian instead of just Christian. Right. And it's still not clear in the 1930s if Catholics count um, in that, you know. And so um the ability for a president to evoke the transcendent has become trickier because what is that you know where is the language we find in which the transcendent is shared rather than divisive is um inclusive rather than exclusionary right like how do you do that and one of the things presidents have done is look to sports 
right? As this, well, we all share that. Well, that's got its own set of problems, right? And so, I, I mean, I, I'd like to hear from Patrick on this, but it, it is a conundrum for rhetoric, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, journalism and transcendence, are you kidding me? I don't know. <laughs> Um, but but all, I mean, as as we all know, I mean, a lot of news, a lot of um, you know journalism content, it, it's it's driven by entertainment, right? It's driven by emotionality. And Peter, as you mentioned, you know, social media has has just hyper, you know, um, uh, uh, accelerated that um, exponentially. Um, uh, but you know, there there is still very much. Um, you know, most Americans think that think that journalists tend to be consequentialists, but that's totally wrong. They're, they're all deontologists. <laughs> they're they're all you know they're all very duty based. They're they're all you know I'm going to write. I, I don't care whose ox is being gored. I'm I, I'm after the good story, right? And I'm going to write this story. Let the chips fall where they may. Uh, that, that that's that defines so much of of political journalism. Um, and, and but there's also there's also as 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 you probably know, Peter, that there's this um, deep, deep in this in the DNA of journalism is this is this strain of social justice, right? Um, uh, you know, uh, journalism should should afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted, right? So, so there there there's there's always been this very activist strain that's always in tension with um, with the with the emotionality with the with the with the thought of of news. As blood sport, as entertainment, as drama, which political news is, right? That's it's it's the great drama. So um, so there's always going to be that that tension. Um, uh, forget about transcendence. I, I I would say though that um, you know I, I do a lot of um, uh, work in in moral development theory and and uh, moral psychology, and and I I'm firmly uh, I believe that there is. You know, organizations, even industries, mature morally just as individuals do, um, and I think we've seen that um, in journalism. You know, from as you said, the penny press, the 1800s, um, hat culture. We've seen this in in public relations. That's still an ongoing project. We're seeing that moral maturing in in advertising and marketing. I would say as well, um, very much still an ongoing project. <laughs> um, but I'm I'm hopeful that that. Um, we might see some, or we might be seeing some cyclical shift. Maybe that's too too uh, uh, too hopeful in big tech, um, because I, you know we can talk about about the perils and problems of journalism all day long. But but um, big tech is is driving so much of that, and and with and and journalism as an industry is hugely vulnerable because the business model is in turmoil, right? Continues to be so. Um, uh, I'm hopeful that um, with with the trust busting measures against Google, with with the, um, you know anti um, monopoly scrutiny and privacy concerns, um, shifting the tables literally with Mr. Zuckerberg, um, maybe we're seeing kind of a, a moral maturing, um, a less uh, a moving out of the wild west uh, uh, environment that we've had in in big tech and, and social media. Um, where we do see, we do recognize that we're not just, you know, uh, we don't just have policies that say, oh yeah, we're resp socially responsible. We're actually going to see that in action, or we ought to see that in action, and we're seeing calls for that. Um, and I think that's going to only bode well for for journalism and um, our, our our culture of of opinion mongering. So. Can I jump in there and ask, I want to ask one more thing before I turn it back to the person supposed to be asking questions. Uh, Professor Stuckey, so I want to ask you a question. I, I emailed you before this that I, I, I might ask, so hopefully it's only a huge surprise. Do people who participate in the public square, the, the my side of it, the, the, the comms guys, the journalism folks, do they have an ethical, and do presidents have an ethical obligation to sort of speak to a broader America or to an American ideal? Like, I mean, you've written that one of the functions of, of presidential rhetoric is to tell Americans who we are and therefore who the other is. And uh, so do we have an obligation to use rhetoric to construct a positive national identity? And then that then begs questions of, is it is it Judeo-Christian, really Christian, but we need the Jewish vote. It didn't include the Catholics, but it turns out they vote a lot too. But really, I don't know what to do about, you know, 
other other group like what is there an ethical obligation i guess to to a a, a political rhetoric that speaks to the better angels of our nature I love this question because um, it is really clear that um, rhetoric has in its constitutive elements um, ethical consequences, right? And if it's going to have ethical consequences, I don't see how you can evade also having ethical responsibility, right? Because the only way to say, oh, I'm now responsible for this is to say, well, my actions didn't have consequences or to later say, oh, oops, right? And so. Presidents have, I mean, presidents don't think constitutively. They think instrumentally, right? You worked in the White House, you know this. President, you know, politicians don't wake up one day and say, how can I make the nation more rhetorically ethical? They wake up and say, how do I get healthcare passed? How do I, right? So, and what appeals work for that, right? If I can wave the flag and get my, my you know, my policy, cool. Like, right, and, and there are certainly limits and there are, is language that individual presidents feel more comfortable with, but there's also the weight of the institution, right? Every president who gives an inaugural, except perhaps Trump, has read previous, or his speech writers have read previous inaugurals and they follow the genre. And the genre does institutional work for the president, right? If you give a State of the Union address and you follow these kinds of expectations, there's going to be institutional, like you are supporting certain kinds of institutional, and those have ethical consequences, right? And so, um, but presidents don't think in, in that frame because they're there for four, if they're lucky, eight years, and they got stuff to do, you know, and the pressure on them is immense. And they live this very weird life in which they don't ever cut their hand opening a can of tuna fish and they never stop at a stoplight and they don't have any of the, you know, they never lose their shoes. Um, they don't have those things that we all have that remind us that we're human and that keep us kind of normal. You know, at the same time, they're constantly getting berated on, um, you know, in the news and in the newspaper and people are yelling at them and you know the tweets are criticizing them and so they live in this particularly weird psychological space in which they think acting on the basis of what's ethical just doesn't even you know they think about oh this is good for the country and that's my ethic but i don't think you know what was it um i can't remember which president it was said the hardest four words in the english language are you're wrong mr president Right? And so holding yourself ethically accountable in that weird space, I think is super hard. But I do think there's an ethical responsibility because there are ethical consequences. So I wanna jump in here as a political scientist, something that we've avoided talking about is how partisanship fits into this. And, um, I'm sorry if this is the question that nobody wants to answer, but you know, of course, partisan um, political communication is very old, right? We've had extremely partisan media into the 19th century forward, right? But I would argue, as many of you have touched on already, that we're in a different kind of media environment of almost, you know, ideas bouncing around, memes, things being replicated over and over and over again. So I wanted to ask you all how partisanship plays a role in potentially this idea of we're potentially improving in terms of ethics of communication, uh, the promotion of fact checking, the promotion of quote unquote truth. How does partisanship play a role in this? So one of my favorite political scientists is uh, Julia Azari, um, who does just fabulous work. And one of her key insights is that we live in a moment of weak parties and strong partisanship. So like, it's sort of this unleashed, um, uncontainable force where um, you know, places like Fox News become infinitely more important than some kinds of, in some, in some contexts, more important than party leaders can be. And so, um, without institutional restraints on that, right? I mean, that's, I think, where we are now. And, and the media guys here 
are all going to be a lot smarter about that than me. No, oh, I, I, um, I, I recently came across this quote, and I actually wrote it down. Um, uh, just the and and Aaron, I was I've been thinking a lot about this too. This our our era of hyper partisanship. I think it's getting worse. Um, I think the media is actually is certainly part of the problem. Um, uh, uh, and and people's people's attachment to their opinions um, is something we really need to, I think, um, pay a lot of attention to. Maybe, maybe in, in, in your areas, um, Mary, uh, Mary um, in political science, you're, you're talking more about this, but, but um, belief attachment um, is, is something that uh, is, is just now being recognized, I think, in, uh, in, in media research. Um, and it's been, it's nothing new, right? Um, people with strong opinions, you know, going around making proclamations, you know, spouting off, oh, I believe this rather than engagement, right? That's always been a problem. The, I, the quote that I wrote down was from Buddha. He's like more than 2,400 years ago. He said, um, those attached to perception and views roam the world offending people. <laughs> and, and I, and we're seeing, we're seeing that, you know, writ large in, in, uh, in, in social media, right? I think part of the problem, of course, and I want to go back to the, the 800 pound gorilla in the media, which is cable television programming, um, which I think is evil, but we can get into that later. Um, since everybody sees politics on cable TV as, as being this, exercise of lobbying, lobbying opinions at each other, right? Um, they, I think a lot of Americans tend to think that, oh, well, that's, that's what political journalism is. Um, and so they're, and then they, you know, they're automatically suspicious of any sources of political news, right? Because, oh, they must be lobbying opinions as well. I just can't see it enough. I can't see it well enough, right? Um, so, so that, that, that cynical, you know, cycle of suspicion, of, of distrust, um, uh, it, it, it's just a huge problem. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly trying to kind of remind people that um, uh, cable TV is not the media. It's not, you know, it's, it's one small um, universe. Um, as Mary said, it often unfortunately has an outsized influence for, for a lot of different reasons, but it's one very, very small, um, uh, part of, of the media environment. But um, uh, we really need to attack the, the issue of media illiteracy if we're going to do anything about um, hyper-partisanship, I think. Well, I think uh, Tomaski has some really interesting, a, a relatively new book, I guess. It's pre-pandemic, so maybe a year and a half old, called uh, If We Can Keep It. And, and he notes that partisanship is it's stronger now, but it's also different now. Uh, there used to be much more um, intra-party division. There were conservative Southern Democrats and liberal Northern Republicans. Now it's much more pure and you're identified by that, by that partisanship rather than the party. And because the parties are weaker, they just can't enforce as much, right? No establishment Republican wanted Trump. Everybody thought they were the right answer, which is one reason we got Trump because there were like 17 guys who said I'm the one and they kind of scattered the votes. Um, but I, I think that it's, it's, and I just want to, I want to tie this to a question in the chat about around the Q&A, about how sort of how the day-to-day -day politics of this actually works, right? A politician's job is to, to get or keep their next job like the rest of us, right? And, and the way you do that, uh, to quote Senator Goldwater, is you, 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 you fish where the fish are, right? You, you hunt where the ducks are, which means I'm going after my votes. And for a lot of reasons, including gerrymandering and some other things, you're much more likely to lose a primary than a general. And you've got to lock up your base and the loyalists who are always going to turn out who are always going to donate, right? So you gin them up and you get them excited, right? We were all getting the email saying the world is going to come to an end. I need your $2 with a 400% match. Otherwise, you know, Nancy Pelosi is going to come take away all your hamburger meat or Donald Trump's going to steal your children or something. Right. So we get ginned up and that base then feeds everything. We get driven into that, which gets echoed in the cable TV sphere, which gets echoed in the digital space. Right. So it's we're not talking to each other and we have algorithms, media models and campaign structures, a little structure in which you run a campaign driving us apart. Right. And then reinforcing that cycle. And, and I think my job as an advocate, as somebody who 
And I do think there are some elected officials who say, how do we do this in a way that makes sense, that's better, that brings us, to, brings us together? I think President Obama did that. Um, I know I've talked, like I, I don't know him, but I know his speechwriters and senior people. But I think maybe one of our challenges as people who teach this and who, who write about it in journalism is to say, we need more of this. And it's not just a banal kumbaya, why can't we just get along? Remember how great it used to be when we were in charge? I think there's gotta be a recognition that uh, politics is rough and tumble and it's competitive and it's sharp elbowed. Um, I have two books, one on ethics, one on soccer, right? I'm a competitive guy. But I think you can do that in a way to, to Professor Stuckey's research that reinforces a rhetoric of who we want to be as a nation that's more united than dividing, even if it's rough and awful around the edges, and to the journalism side that says we're going to sell newspapers and we're going to like, we're not going to make people read long, boring think pieces. We're going to have clever, smart, interesting things. We're going to do it in a way that makes all of us better, if that makes any sense. But I think part of it, a lot of it, frankly, is on me and my industry to just do that better. So I just wanted to follow up with you, Peter, really quickly. You have a series of conversations about ethics in political communication that you do with professionals. So I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about what are professionals saying about what we're talking about here? Because they know it's happening. Are they trying to communicate more ethically? What do they see as the challenges? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked. So one of the things we do with the Project on Ethics and Political Communication is a five question series where I ask a bunch of people the same five questions. And when I do video chats, I try to bring together um, professionals and philosophers and students and others, right? So it's not just a bunch of academics telling everybody else they'd only be like the world would be better if everybody went to Penn State and GW. I think we can agree on that, right? But I try to I try to actually mix it up. So I had a video conversation with a candidate for office in Maricopa County, which is Phoenix, and a philosophy professor. Like, how does this go day to day? The five question series has I asked five five questions: What ethical standards should political communication be held? Where should political communication ethics be grounded? Uh, why should someone in political communication behave ethically? Which I think gets to some of the questions in the Q and A. Can you give an example of ethical political communication? What can people point to and say, do more of that? I tried asking, point to something that you did that was wrong and why. I couldn't answer that question, so I wasn't gonna ask you know, the guy who oversaw paid media for Clinton to ask it. Uh, can you give an example of an ethical challenge or question you or political communication professionals face in your field or have faced or likely to face? And finally, what advice about ethics do you have for people studying political communication or starting their careers in the field? And I've asked this of, of lobbyists, Democrat and Republican, um, journalists at the, the Washington Examiner, Jennifer Rubin weighed in, a former Chuck Schumer senior staffer weighed in, a Republican opera researcher weighed in. And, and I think there, there's consensus that it needs to be better. And they all got into politics because they want to make the world better. I, I asked a friend of mine who's a venture capitalist these questions, and he echoed it. The politics ought to reflect the best of who we are and the best of who we can be, right? And that if we are privileged enough to make a living working in the guts of our democracy, we have a responsibility to, to the body, which is the democracy. But uh, we also all pay the rent. Um, nobody ever hired me because I ran a fantastically well thought out, constructive creative campaign that got its ass kicked, right? I get hired because I win. Um, and if you've got to make a choice and if your client or the candidate or the congressman says, do this, you say, well, actually, sir, I don't think we should do it that way. Do this. Well, I don't know. You choose. You either go with your boss or you quit. And if you're a partisan, I think, you know what, I'm going to say yes this time because whoever follows me is going to do worse. And besides, the stakes are so high. I have a lot of Republican friends who supported Trump because of tax cuts and judges. The stakes are simply too high. Trump will come and go judges and tax cuts. I have Democratic friends, a lot of Democratic friends who held their nose and voted for Biden because they thought, look, the alternative is a hellscape. I, but everybody I know who works in this field came to politics because they believe in the promise of the American democracy and feel lucky to be able to make a living in it. The challenge for them is how can they do that, advance issues and causes they care about, and keep their job, which is something we all struggle with in all of our lines of work. So if it's all right with everybody, um, given the time, I'd like to shift over to uh, some Q&A. There's some interesting questions here. And uh, actually, Peter, to your point about making a living, 
Um, so we have a question. Um, no one has talked about money, votes, and advertising as it relates to ethical behavior. And great question kind of to get to this point. I'll start and let the actual academics beat me up on this one. Um, I, I, we've always, there's always been false advertising. Um, Adams made stuff up about Jefferson. Jefferson did not stoop to respond. He paid someone to do it for him. Alexander Hamilton, writing under an assumed name, made stuff up about Jefferson. Like, yeah, and it's, I think people learn from political ads and we're not counting issues, right? There's never a point in American history where everybody had huge spreadsheets, right? Either Excel or paper with lining up issues. We vote for people we trust. We vote for people who look like us, who sound like us, who go to church with us. That's always been a part of the mix. Um, and I think that's like, we just have to accept that and make those ads both effective and hard hitting and good and sort of good little G and good big G. Uh, money's a part of that, right? Money allows people to participate and money is in the system. And, and I think dark money is a problem and hidden money is a problem, but we're not gonna ban money from politics. The Supreme Court has said as much, quite apart from whether or not it makes any sense, the Supreme Court has, has said as much. And the reason you get votes is like people vote for you and you, of course you've got to go after your votes. So none of us goes to work every day and says, you know what, I thank you very much for the job. I think you're all idiots. I'm going to do this job instead. You get fired, right? And candidates who run, who go too far astray of their, of their voters do the same thing. And that's frankly how our system was designed. I think the question for me is how can all of us in the media, in, in the media and in politics use these tools responsibly in a way that speaks to Professor Stuckey's research and arguments that there's something more at stake here than the next election or the next piece of legislation and this idea, and that's sort of this construction of who we are and who we wanna be as a people. Yeah, and if, if I can um, just echo that um, from, the, from the media side, um, you know, just as you said, Peter, that the, the, uh, the motives of most people in politics, it's the same in journalism, right? You don't go into journalism to, to, to get rich. You, you go in because you, you're passionate about the work. You feel like you can make a difference, right? Um, all of those. Um, uh, the problem is, well, one of the problems is, you know, as I said earlier, journalism as an industry is just so vulnerable right now. It is decimated. Um, there's been 20,000 jobs uh, lost in journalism over the last four years. Um, uh, and so that what that means is um, we have we have local governments, we have politicians at the local and state level who may it, it's a good chance they they they're not talking to local reporters. They won't contact local reporters. They won't being they're not being asked questions about their behavior. Um, as uh, as as David Simon uh, told a congressional congress uh, a panel years ago. Um, we are we are entering a golden age of local corruption because of the decimation of local journalism. I can point to places on a, on the map in the country where I know I used to cover those local governments. There is nobody there. There's nobody there. So so there's a there's a there's a problem with the the business model. We are struggling with that. It's going to be years before we figure that out. There's also there on the hopeful side. There's also some really good hybrids. Some some new models coming out. Subscription models. You know. Um, nonprofits, whatever, that are producing some really good content, um, but they're fragile, and we're we're not sure what's gonna what's gonna work there. Um, my, my, I guess what I'd say to to anybody in the audience who who is not paying for news in some way and who complains about the media, I would say kindly shut the hell up. <laughs> I mean, you you got to pay for it. And good journalism is expensive, um, and and so we're seeing the problem of of free content and what that what that produces. Yeah, I, I would very much like to echo that. Um, I always tell my students that you get the kind of government that you're willing to work for, right? And if you're not holding people accountable, they're going to do things that you're not going to like. Um, and with gerrymandering, with the, you know, voter suppression, with, with the institutional structures of, our, of a democratic government, um, you know, those are also fragile. And 
um, we can't assume that what the authors of um, How Democracies Die call democratic guardrails, we can't assume that those are gonna save us, right? They're fragile and they're getting more fragile in some ways. I mean, right, the, 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 the trick of a moment in which institutions are fragile is that it can go both ways. There, is, there are these you know, really hopeful signs um, but there's also super scary danger, you know, Will Robinson kinds of things happening out there. And um, if citizens themselves, I mean, one of the fabulous things about the most recent election was the amount of grassroots, hardcore effort with very little institutional support. But that's hard to sustain. I and mean, that's what institutions are good for, right, is sustaining collective action. And their trust in government is low. The institutions are fragile. The media isn't very, isn't super well trusted. Um, you know, we're in this position where nobody trusts the media, nobody trusts the government. Uh, it's a scary moment for me. So, um, if I might, there's a, a former colleague named Nikki Usher has a book. It's either just out or will be out soon called "News for the Rich, White, and Blue: How Place and Power Distort American Journalism," and she goes at the local news angle. Um, but also looking at just like physically where our newspapers located, right? If you're downtown, you're writing about news differently than if your offices are in the suburbs because you run into different people. And you're getting coffee in the morning, the person giving you the coffee sounds and looks different and they have different challenges. You look around you, you see and hear different things. Um, it's, it's, I, had a, I had a friend who was one of those layoffs, one of the, he was laid off from the Rocky Mountain Daily News, which is one of the first major dailies to, to fold a bunch of years ago. And he bought a local newspaper. He bought a weekly newspaper in, in a tiny little town in New Mexico, Santa Rosa, New Mexico, which at the time was a two newspaper town. They had two weekly newspapers. And the town, as he described, is halfway between Albuquerque and Texas. And it exists mostly because of Route 66 and it's hanging on to what's left of that. One of the, one of the newspapers folded. Um, he wrote an impassioned editorial against their closing because he thought two newspapers was better than one, even though it redounded to his benefit. And he, when he went into it, he said that he went in trying to save uh, journalism, right? He went to Northwestern and he was going to write the gritty story, the person on the street that wasn't heard before, revealing the underbelly. You know, it's a dark town with a thousand stories, probably actually just a thousand given the size of the town. And, but he said quickly he learned that his job was to save the town because the newspaper reminded the town who they were. It covered high school basketball and every Christmas, Letters to Santa was a special insert. And graduation season was here, all the high school graduates and where they're going, University of New Mexico, New Mexico State, a community college, the military, right? And the point of the newspaper was kind of the town. And if you lose that, if we lose that fabric, as people, we are, going back to the Greeks, uh, man is a political animal, right? We find a community and we construct that community, right? Absent a local newspaper to remind us of who we are, absent a president or elected officials reminding us who we can be better together, we latch onto something else, right? And maybe that's a conspiracy theory. Maybe it's 8chan, maybe it's QAnon. Um, and certainly on the Democratic side, we've got our own, our own fair number as well. Um, so it's not like we're suddenly gonna become free of being people. It's that as people, we wanna be something. One of the functions of rhetoric is to bind us together, so draw us together and to give us purpose. It had, there are ethics, there's an, an ethical mandate to it. And I think that unless journalism solves itself, and Nikki and others have some good ideas there, and unless politics says, you know what, the reason we got into politics matters more than the next election, um, I think we're gonna go off the wrong guard well, Professor Stuckey, but if we get it right, um, I think we could come out in a better, stronger place as a result, I hope. So there's another question here, somewhat related to what we've been talking about, about um, a changing landscape of the news and those folks who are actually working in the news. Um, Catherine Mandel asks, news has long been consumptive. Is there a disconnect currently between the historically contingent commodification of it and the current consumptive habits of consumers given the influence of social media? And how is this influenced by the different education and experiences of journalists versus that of the larger market? 
Yeah, good, good question. Um, uh, yeah, it's always been consumptive, if, if I understand your use of that term. Um, uh, we've always had a commercial media system, right? Um, journalism is lives and dies in, in commerce, uh, is advertisers supported, um, and that has all sorts of, of implications. Um, uh, and and on the on the journalism side, inside the newsroom, we we have a lot of information about what journalists are and what are, what are their demographic profiles. Um, and as as Peter said, um, uh, they're unfortunately they are often different from the people that they cover that they write about. Um, uh, most American journalists are generally better educated than the average American. Um, tend to be from more urban or suburban areas than the average American versus small town rural areas. Yeah, they're less religious than the average American. So there's all kinds of really important, dis significant distinctions between the, the nature of American journalists and, and the people that they cover. Um, and that's been a chronic problem. We've, we've had, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen, oh gosh, I, I can't even count them, the, the diversity initiatives launched in newsrooms, launched in newspaper chains and, and uh, TV affiliates over the decades. And it just hasn't really caused a dent. I mean, it, it, in terms of, in terms of um, racial diversity, that's a chronic problem. Um, and so, yeah, you're, you see um, news that, that caters to the, the worldview, how those journalists see the world, right? Um, uh, it's not that you know, they, they're, they're um, necessarily hostile to religion, they just don't see religious issues as a newsworthy thing. It's not on their radar, right? So, um, uh, so we don't want to assign any kind of malicious motive to it usually. It's, it's just a different worldview, right? You ask different questions if, if, you, if you see the world a particular way. So, so in that sense, um, uh, you know, there, it's always, we've, we've always struggled within a, a commercial media system. We always will. The problem, of course, is social media has, has really disrupted that to an extent where everybody expect, well, the internet disrupted it to a large extent, um, uh, uh, leading to cultivating this idea that news is free, right? Um, and that was, the, that was the original sin of American journalism in the internet era, right? Was, which was to say, oh yeah, let's give our stuff away in the hopes of building audiences. Well, we know how that ended. Um, and, and so now we're stuck with a, a, a commercial system where the money is not flowing to the journalism, it's flowing to um, the big tech companies who are who are um, aggregating that content, making use of it, appropriating it, and selling selling that data to advertisers, right? So um, again, I'm I'm kind of hopeful that that higher levels of scrutiny, bigger questions about the social responsible um, role of of social media and big tech, um, maybe we'll you know we'll start we'll start seeing. Um, some challenges there, I don't know, but it's going to be a while. I think you know um, uh, journalism is a wounded animal right now, and and um, it's going to take a long time to kind of reconstruct audiences. It's going to take a long time to to, um, to rebuild those communities, as Peter said, that um, that has have lost their journalism, um, and and we see we we we've learned that hard lesson that 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 people's sense of community and where they get their information on the local level is so deeply intertwined. Right, so we have a question um, coming in here on this topic um, from Sydney Ford. Um, they ask, in our normative understanding that informative journalism is fundamental to democracy, and in the increasingly profit-driven journalism industry in crisis motivated by advertising dollars over serving as a public good, what ethical obligations do you feel governments have in addressing this market dilemma, negatively impacting political communication? Again, to kind of sum up, what's the role of government in trying to address some of these ethical problems that journalists might face between the market and doing what's right? Well, um, Sydney, I'll, I'll, at first I'll say I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we are even we are more profit driven as a as an industry than 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 ever. Um, I'm not sure that's the case. I mean, I, I was with the Chicago Tribune Company in its in its golden years. And um, I literally saw people being marched out of the newsroom to protect a profit market margin of 21%. Um, and, and that's, you know, that, that was common in in those days. It is not common now. 
Um, and so the, 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 the profit, the, the profit, profitability of news organizations has been, has been eroded seriously. Um, uh, and so we're, you know, we're seeing different, different hybrid models. We're seeing different efforts to um, find ways to sustain good journalism. Um, I'm sorry, Aaron, the, re the, the other half of, of Sydney's question, that might need to go to Peter or, or Mary. Yeah, basically, what's the obligation of the government to do anything about all of this? The government involvement always sounds super enticing, right? Oh, government's got the resources, they can bail out journalists. Government money always comes with strings. Every president and every politician on the planet has, um, you know, spin doctoring is not new. What's new is that with the Reagan administration, especially, the media started feeling manipulated by the Reagan by the Reagan administration's communication strategies, and so they started covering those strategies, which is one of the reasons why no one trusts either politicians or the media, because. Um, it didn't look like, oh, I'm just trying to get my point of view across. It was, look at how they're manipulating you, right? And so if you let the government in the door, where they already are, by the way, um, there's gonna, because getting rid of the fairness doctrine um, had consequences. Um, there are a lot of people who study the media who would be very interested to see the equal time provision, the, the fairness doctrine, those things reinstated. Um, so government has a regulatory role. Um, when it comes to giving government money, that starts to get a lot trickier because then who do you owe your allegiance to? Where are you? How do you hold the people who are paying your bills accountable? That's always a problem for journalists. Uh, that would be a huge problem, I think, under those circumstances. And, and I also think that um, government has always had a long, large role in constructing and defining what's news, right? I mean, anybody who studies foreign policy or international relations knows it's true in the nth degree there because these are far away, they're complicated foreign languages and you really kind of rely on, on press releases coming out of, out of DOD or state. Um, I think that the, the behind the scenes, did you know stuff, I mean, I think predates Reagan. I think the press might have really just ramped it up with Reagan because he just kind of made stuff up out of whole cloth, right? And they would keep pointing out that, no, 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 this is from his movies. This isn't from real life. Why aren't you people getting it? And there's a whole barrel full of narrative theory that says, because stories matter, facts don't. It's how the fact fits the story. But if you look at, you know, you look at the selling of the president in 1968, you look at um, Hunter Thompson's funeral of the campaign trail in 1972, you go back to the making of the president in 1960. You could even arguably go back to, um, Oh, got it over here. The early, the hidden persuaders, right? Did you know kind of stuff? And I think that's kind of always been there. Um, I think that bringing the, the fairness doctrine, equal time, and even some media ownership rules, both vertical and horizontal consolidation, so that, you know, um, one company just owns whole wide swatches of things. I, that, that might make sense in the abstract, but constitutionally, I think it's suspect. Right? The reason we could actually have a fairness doctrine and have an equal time rule is because it's for over the air broadcast. And that was a finite resource like water, which gave the justification for regulating. It's a public good. Otherwise you suffer from the tragedy of the commons. You had radio stations broadcasting over each other. You had hate radio, you know, Father Coughlin and all of that, right? But I don't know that there is a way practically or constitutionally to regulate cable, satellite, streaming, or the internet. Right, I don't ask this question flippantly. I think this matters. Where are we? I'm in, in a house in Washington, DC. I'm looking at a computer that's bouncing something who knows where to people watching this. I don't know where the viewers or the listeners are. I don't know where any of you all are. So whose laws would regulate that? And how would we regulate that? Right, I think it's really, really tricky. Um, I just, yeah. So I think we have time for one last question. Um, this is mostly for Peter, but um, I'd like to invite both Patrick and Mary to please you know, weigh in as well. So uh, Daniel Wolk asks, the political theorist Mark Warren suggested that a, po a politician's ethical responsibility is to make decisions on the merits of arguments and no less importantly, give ample evidence 
that that is what they're doing. They also show that they take into consideration the views of their constituents and give honest justification for going against these views. In short, they make honest judgments in favor of the common good rather than act out of self-interest. Does this view have any influence in politics? Um, I think every politician will tell you, of course, they're acting in the public interest. If you ask Senator Hawley or Senator Schumer or AOC or anybody else, why did you vote that way? It's obviously in the public interest. No one's going to stand up and say, I did it for purely selfish motives. I'm hoping to get reelected and later get a high paying job. And most of them believe they are doing it in the public interest, even if not this one vote, then what's going to come down the line from it. I don't think that's new. From my perspective, I, I try to artificially divide these two things between how one ought represent, right? And that's a whole nother debate. Are you a curator? Do you represent the best views of your constituents? Are they all the information you had? Like all of that. My interest is in how do we talk about it? And it's the honest explanation piece that really grabs me there, right? And it's the, um, how do I explain this in a way that not only defends my position, but from my perspective, advances a democratic ideal in which we want to participate, right? Back to, again, to Professor Stuckey's research on, on presidential addresses. Like, how do we do this in a way that strengthens those, those, those guardrails? Um, I think that matters a lot. And the last piece I would throw in is actually insights from um, a, a Professor uh, David Frank at the University of Oregon who wrote a, um, a chapter in the, the ethics book I, I wrote on speech writing. And he argues that one of the roles of a good speech writer is to make sure the best arguments are being heard, right? Part of the question was based on the best arguments. Who are the experts in arguments? Comms people, because we construct them. Hopefully we understand them and look at how they go. So should you, do you as a press secretary, a speech writer, a comms director, not just on a campaign or a congressional office, but also in an advocacy group have an obligation to push the argument around to make sure the argument itself is as sound as possible, which then helps create a better decision, which you then go sell to whomever you have to sell it. And I want to say that what that depends on is, a, is a, what is precisely most difficult in American politics, because it depends on the long view, right? You have to be able to take the hit in the short run to get the best arguments out there. And American politics is terrible, um, providing incentives for the long view. It punishes you for the long view. Yeah. Uh, I've worked in the House and the Senate. I, I love the House um, because something's always on fire. But that means like the long, like you get, you have six months to govern and, and you're always watching your flank to your left or to your right, depending on which side of my computer screen you're sitting on. You're constantly raising money, like the the long view. What do you like the like lunchtime is my long view at this point. In the Senate, you get some more leeway. You can really kind of govern for about four years. In the White House, you get a little bit longer. And also at the end of an administration, it's you know Mary bar the door. It's like what are, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? But it's it, it, the and because of gerrymandering and because of uh, how people are sorting stuff we talked about earlier earlier in the conversation. Not only do, do voters say they want bipartisanship, but don't actually, they actually punish you for it. Can you believe they talked to, you said something nice about Senator Romney, what kind of a traitor are you? You said something nice about Speaker Pelosi. During the health care, I worked on the Affordable, health, the Affordable Care Act in the House of Representatives, and, and at one of these town hall meetings in, in Oklahoma, um, a constituent with, with, with Senator Coburn, Republican, conservative Republican senator at the time, a constituent sort of lambasting then Speaker Pelosi, and um, the senator defended her. I said, I disagree with her, but she, you need to know she's a good person. She's smart. She's a good human being. He got booed. Now, you want to take the long view. You can't get through a meeting defending the Speaker of the House of Representatives as not being un-American. Yeah, and, and as Mary said, the, the difficulty with with or the loneliness of, of taking that long view. I mean, that certainly translates to political news as well, right? I mean, so we see the news dominated by what I mentioned earlier, episodic framing, right? Where it's, it's just focused on the latest development, the latest fight, the latest triumph, the latest loser, whatever. Um, uh, and, and, and that framing of politics leads to a very specific type of understanding by the American public, right? Um, it leads to an understanding of politics as 
as mano a mano. It's, 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 a, it's an individualistic level fist fight more than anything, right? Um, and, and so uh, it, 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 by definition, um, reinforces these very individualistic values of, you know, um, self-sufficiency, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, we, we all uh, are responsible for creating our own destiny. We know that's not necessarily true, but, but that kind of episodic framing emphasizes certain individualistic values, whereas thematic framing, right, come, pulling back and trying to, trying to look at the bigger picture or offer a bigger picture, right, um, that's harder to do. It, it, it's difficult, it's more expensive, um, and yet that can lead to, I, I would argue, a healthier um, uh, public understanding of, of our government, of, of the way politics, the, the potential of, poli of politics in our, in our American life. Um, and, and as I said earlier, it, that, that kind of framing um, gets us closer, I think, to the aspiration of the best political journalism, which is opening our eyes to the people who are different from us and, and, and creating spaces for actual engagement, not just lobbying of opinions, so. It's a very optimistic point to end on. Um, are there any last thoughts? I think we are a little bit past our time. I, I wanna say thank you very much for the opportunity. I've, I've learned a ton. It's been a fascinating conversation. And, and I think any conversation where you come out a little more confused um, and knowing a little bit more than when you went in is a conversation worth having. So thank you all for, for hosting this, this really terrific, this really terrific event. Yes, thank you very much. So I'd like to thank all of you. Um, thanks to Peter, to Mary, to Patrick for your really interesting conversation and enthusiastic par uh, participation in this. Thanks to all the attendees and hopefully we will see you all in person again soon. Thanks everyone.